Take it off. I'm fine. You're vaccinated, right? Good. Good answer. You ought to just laminate it. Have a little laminated card and you just say. Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're set to go. It's about 6.30, so we can kick off the, the City Council work session. We've got one item on the agenda um, on 2022 budget discussion for park development philosophy. So, Laura, if you would please take it away. Back on. It's cold, isn't it? Uh, and I will ask, Emily, if you could pull up the PowerPoint presentation for us, please. Um, last week, we had talked about kind of spending some time this evening talking about philosophies as it relates to financing improvements for parks and recreation. Um, we also received, after our last meeting, kind of the final numbers from the county related to the revenue neutral rate uh, for the mill levy and the implications or implications that has under the Senate Bill 13. So we wanted to touch on that briefly, knowing that we are will be going in um, at our July 7th Finance and Administration Committee meeting for a total look at um, the complete 2022 budget, including the five-year capital improvement program, uh, supplemental requests and recommendations um, moving, moving through that process. So we'll touch on the calendar again uh, at the end of, of our presentation and conversation this evening, um, but wanted to just spend some time again talking about approach, um, and that I think will help guide um, staff as we finalize the, the recommended budget that you will see in two weeks. So Emily, if you could do next slide, please. So this evening, I know in the memo, um, there was a lot of background and history and really the point of that was, and it's interesting because I had forgotten some of the things that, we, the conversations that we've had and discussions that the city has had over the last 20 years or so relative to parks and recreation. And we won't spend a lot of time on that, that this evening. I think it's just important to, to lay that out there and kind of see in many ways how um, maybe not the, the funding alternatives and the funding paths towards parks and recreation priorities are the same today as, as what previous councils have exhibited, but many of the goals uh, and objectives have been the same. So tonight, before we dive into parks and recreation, I do wanna just kind of talk about the bigger picture of kind of our total asset uh, management strategy and where we are in some of those components and where some of uh, we see either opportunities or, or threats or work that still needs to be done. Obviously, that's going to play significantly into our budget conversations on the 7th. Then we'll talk a little bit about kind of park improvement um, and planning and implementation, um, including um, the investments and priorities that have been made in the, in the past, but as well as some of the ones and decisions that we've made really just in the last 12 to 18 months. The fact that parks and recreation, like all of our asset categories, is challenging because we have competing priorities within that asset category. Uh, kind of a recommended implementation timeline for some of the priorities that we've identified in, um, in terms of outdoor park improvements, but also moving us toward renewal of the parks and recreation sales tax, which we know expires. Uh, and, and in particular, where um, kind of a dog park conversation fits in uh, in that timeline. And then we've got some current sort of decision or at least discussion points that I think is, will be important. Uh, we don't need to, to land definitively on any of those this evening, but wanted to make sure that uh, we had the opportunity to present those um, 
as we move through the rest of the budget conversations. Then we'll touch briefly again on just the impact of Senate Bill 13 and the implications for the 2022 budget and then review our remaining budget calendar. So Emily, next slide, please. So here's a slide that, that I think um, our hope is we'll continue to use this and build this out uh, in the future. But this is really trying to take that listing of all of those asset categories that we've identified over the last several years um, and, and the subcategories underneath. Um, oh, we'll wait. And I think I left a presentation at everyone's place. Um, but it's challenging sometimes uh, for, for staff, uh, and I know that translates um, to the council and to the public as well, to sort of understand and think about where we are in relationship to all of these categories and potentially the interplay um, <clears throat> and the impacts and the interrelationships, particularly as it relates to funding. Because even though we have very specific dedicated funding streams uh, for parks, for stormwater, and for streets, um, turning the knob or turning the dial on any one of those categories then also potentially impacts conversations around mill levy and other revenue streams. So streets, I think everyone is familiar that streets is where we focused a tremendous amount of attention over the last 24 months, getting circling back, getting the residential street program sorted out, prioritized, and to the point where we felt like we could make a confident recommendation for renewal of our street sales tax. And so, as you know, at our June meeting, um, the council approved the ballot language for a mail ballot election in September um, to look at renewing that quarter cent sales tax and actually increasing that to three eighths of a cent to fund streets. So our, our street components, things that feed into those street decisions um, are obviously that 10 year residential street plan, the cars projects, which we know uh, in many cases are large in scale and will require either outside funding or considerations surrounding debt financing. Bridges uh, is something that um, we evaluate every other year and need to keep out in front of us and then sidewalks. And we've kind of had the conversations around sidewalks about making sure we can maintain what we have before we aggressively start adding more sidewalks, but certainly keeping sidewalks front and center in that conversation uh, in, in that asset management category is important. Stormwater is probably the next area where we have uh, completed the most significant work in terms of building out that total asset inventory. So we, we have completed that, that um, inventory and condition rating. Um, we were able to leverage SMAC funding to help be able to get that, that accomplished. And so that is now helping to inform both the decisions as it relates to stormwater um, repairs and maintenance that occur with street projects, as well as standalone uh, pipes. And as we know, we came to you um, with the sinkhole at 55th and Woodson, um, which was a condition five CMP pipe that we're in the process of repairing now. So we, we've got that asset inventory, we'll continue to maintain that. Um, we need to really develop, we've done some preliminary work around a channel maintenance program and we have kind of clean, clean out and routine maintenance uh, of, of our channels, I think on a four year rotating cycle. Um, the bigger channel maintenance and repairs, uh, particularly the remainder of Rock Creek as it flows through uh, downtown is still an area that needs to be addressed. And then again with stormwater, how, how do we want and how will that integrate with our street maintenance program? Um, we're still in a little bit of a holding pattern waiting for the watershed study to come out of SMAC that will give us some additional guidance in terms of how we can apply for projects and where projects might make some sense. So we're all, I know, anxiously awaiting um, the release of, of that watershed study so we can really dive back in and and do some planning there. Um, I think, let me back up. So I think, you know, where are we today in streets? We know we've got the renewal of the sales tax out there. Um, we know we have committed to continuing to dedicate or we've dedicated the equivalent of seven mills um, from the general fund to street maintenance. Um, and so I think there will be continued discussion around, you know, assuming we are successful in passing and renewing that sales tax, then looking at how do we 
um, want to or how can we potentially use those funds um, to accelerate some of the street program and, and accomplish that you know, faster. But first hurdle is let's get that street sales tax renewed. Then we sort of know what, what we're working with and um, can bring debt financing packages um, pretty quickly thereafter. In the stormwater category, uh, again, we're waiting on the watershed study. Um, and as you'll see when we present the CIP in a couple of weeks, um, and we've talked about this in previous budget cycles, um, as long as the Gateway Project is paying their $600,000 a year special assessment, we have the ability not only to meet our existing debt service obligations, but to consider taking on new stormwater projects. Uh, really up to this point, um, we have set the stormwater utility fee at a rate that covers our existing debt service. And so if we see something change in the coming months or years that, that could impact that special assessment, we will have some decisions to make in the next couple of budget cycles relative to how to just once again make that debt, annual debt service payment with stormwater debt. And our stormwater debt uh, is some of the longest debt that we have on the books. It extends out through 2029. So we're looking at, um, again, probably a threat in, in that uh, category potentially. Parks, I'll skip over. That's really will be the focus of the rest of our discussion this evening. But we also know we have public buildings and facilities out there. Um, we've had a preliminary space needs analysis for City Hall and the police station uh, with a number that we don't think is is sustainable for our community. So we really need to get, get out and start reevaluating options as it relates to that, because we also know that the space considerations, particularly in the police department, as it relates to locker room space and some of those amenities um, are continue to present challenges for us. Public Works, that's a building that was reconstructed in 2007. Um, but again, now part of our asset inventory is something we need to think about ongoing maintenance uh, for. And that was a building that was replaced um, in 2007. Um, the water, when it would rain, water would actually, we had about 12 to 18 inches of water that ran through the floor of that building, making it virtually impossible for us to store equipment or for the crews to be able to function. So that was a, a really critical need that was addressed back in 2007. The farmer's market, uh, I put that in the, in the, it could really go probably either in the parks category or the public buildings and facilities. Uh, we've had conversations around structures, around improvements at that site to support the activities that we want there. Uh, public parking lots, uh, not only those that serve our city facilities, but also um, there are several parking lots that we own, own in the downtown corridor. Um, that are in need of repair and upgrades. Uh, we know that we had tentatively earmarked some of the proceeds um, that we received from the EPC, the locale project, uh, for that purpose. Um, but timing of that in relationship in particular to some of the channel repairs, uh, particularly the parking lots on Outlook is something that we'll have to continue to coordinate. Johnson Drive Streetscape, that's something that um, we hear from the merchants about pretty regularly. Um, we've had a couple of really rough years in terms of weather, whether it be heat or heat and then quick freezes. Uh, and the landscaping doesn't present necessarily the best image along that corridor. So that's actually something that will be, um, was included as a supplemental request that you'll see in two weeks. So talking about that, and then also the tree canopy, as we've, as we've come through some of our retreats in uh, this, this last year, we've really identified and wanted to call out specifically the, the urban tree canopy uh, as an asset that we want to protect. And so again, I put it in the, the public buildings and facilities category because I think that tree canopy extends beyond our parks. So it's street trees, it's a variety of different things. And again, we'll have some conversations around some supplemental requests or some carryover of, of some things the council has discussed in previous budgets. Technology, uh, we know we've um, had funding approved for replacing and upgrading our court software, our building permitting software, our financial management software. Um, we have uh, obviously hardware replacement and upgrade needs on an ongoing basis. Uh, we've 
had the potential for um, discussing an e-ticketing system um, that would communicate with the new court software. So that's another category that we haven't historically included in your five-year capital improvement program, but one that, that we are starting to turn more attention to and focus on building out. And then vehicles and equipment. Um, you know, typically we're looking at that, the departments have a 10-year equipment um, replacement schedule. And so we evaluate that as a part of the, the budget request each year. We look at um, maintenance considerations. So if something is not experiencing significant issues from a maintenance perspective, um, I think you see as we bring forward major um, equipment purchases, we, we continue to extend that life and um, really try to get that value. Um, but we also need to continually evaluate our vehicle and equipment needs really based on our program and service delivery priorities and objectives. So um, we, you've seen the Public Works Department in particular request different types of equipment as they've become more heavily involved in street maintenance. Uh, than perhaps what they've had in the past. So as you all know, it, you know, each year, um, this year, next year, and well into the future, it's just a constant rebalancing of needs and priorities across all of these categories um, and trying to figure out where, um, where we want to increase potentially revenues or make modifications to our service delivery standards. So next slide, please. Oh, and I, I forgot to put streetlights and traffic signals on the um, public facilities. So we'll go back and add that. See, there's always something. So just very quickly, uh, most of this, all of this information really was included um, in the memo that, that went out Friday. But again, I just I think it's important to just really highlight that um, Parks and Recreation ha has been a priority um, investment for the community since really it's incorporation. Um, and you know what we all I think know and appreciate is that parks and recreation amenities uh, are often um, rarely is probably a better expression, rarely self-sufficient in terms of their cost recovery. But we have seen time and time again that the public has an interest in, um, in adding to and building out these amenities to impact our quality of life. So really started um, the outdoor pool was you know, built in 1956, community center, both the original construction and the expansion. The expansion was, um, was done through a vote, a vote of the public for a quarter cent sales tax, the acquisition and an addition of green space. Um, so with the purchase of Mohawk School, and this is one I had forgotten until I was going back to sit down and look that we bought that and then uh, the council at that time actually increased a mill and dedicated a mill for a 10 year period of time to finance the acquisition of that site, um, just based on the availability of other funds. And then that mill was converted uh, later into general fund operations. And then legacy park. So we're always looking for um, opportunities to add green space. Um, when we negotiated the mission crossing development, we asked that the developer dedicate or donate that land at the corner and $100,000 uh, to be able to provide um, more passive green space in that, that area of town where some didn't exist. The city then made an additional investment of about $30,000 to um, to add the amenities, um, and we continue really now to be focused on adding trees through the celebration tree program. We're, I think we're all familiar with the reconstruction of the outdoor pool in 2014. Um, I think what what many don't remember is that there was a recommendation about two years prior to that uh, in a feasibility study for a new pool um, that recommended about a $6.3 million uh, replacement pool. And the council at that time said, we can't afford this. We have too many other competing priorities as it relates to streets and stormwater. And so we need to, we need to take that proposal and put that proposal on the shelf. Uh, at the time, there were about two and a half million dollars worth of repairs that needed to be done. And that pool was really reaching a critical point in its life of we either have to do replace it, spend two and a half million dollars to repair it, 
Um, but that was certainly one where we kind of got right up to the finish line and the council said that we've got to focus on some other priorities. And then, then a task force was formed again a couple of years later, came back um, and brought forth a recommendation for the $4.1 million pool with the recommendation to finance that with the quarter cent sales tax. And then um, council member Quinn uh, actually suggested that that be increased to three eighths of a cent because of many of the needs that we were seeing in terms of deferred maintenance here at the community center. Um, and so that's that's how we got our current parks and recreation sales tax with that 10 year sunset. And as we know about 60% of that uh, annual revenue is dedicated to debt service on the pool. So the debt service um, expires or rolls off terminates at the same time that the sales tax expires. With that and with the um, 38 cent sales tax, um, we embarked on a parks and recreation master plan. Um, at least in my tenure here, there had been two other sort of attempts at a master plan. There was a staff generated master plan, which um, focused very, um, very heavily on just maintenance of the existing amenities. There wasn't a lot of addition of new, um, new amenities in the parks. And then um, the challenge was there was no funding available to implement recommendations from that plan. And then um, there was also a citizen task force that was formed that didn't make a whole lot of progress in terms of establishing and landing on, um, on priorities. So again, I, I'm not even sure that group ever got to a final report and master plan. So we were able to engage um, the consultants to do the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, which was the overarching sort of umbrella looking at all areas of the operation and knowing that that plan would have to be brought down to um, more specific levels, whether that be at each individual park or at the community center or a variety of different things. Um, and that it, it did identify, um, I think as council member Schlossmacher said a couple of weeks ago, there were 1,272 number one priorities, um, something close to that, right? Um, and so what, what, has been, what is the right process going forward to kind of bring that down and identify those priorities, particularly as it relates to our outdoor park system? The, the answer to that, um, that the council approved was that our conceptual park planning processes, which we kicked off with the, the planning process for Mohawk, um, and we had intended to be through all of the, the major parks. Um, so Anderson, um, Mohawk, Broadmoor, Anderson, Streamway, and I may be forgetting one, but the at least Waterworks. Um, and our hope had been, and the original time schedule had been to have all of that park planning done as we went into this 2022 budget process. We know that those processes were slowed down by COVID. Um, we do have um, the Broadmoor Park Steering Committee, which I know, uh, so Council Member Floor was on the Mohawk Park Steering Committee. Council Member Inman is on the Broadmoor Park Steering Committee. Um, Council Member Thomas, uh, tomorrow night kicks off uh, membership on the Waterworks Steering Committee. Um, and we'll talk here in just a few minutes about kind of some recommendations relative to Streamway and some of the other parks. But um, Waterworks is, is gearing up. Broadmoor has been through the, the stakeholder group and the steering committee has been through the development of conceptual plans. And today we mailed out about 250 uh, invitations to residents um, in the area of Broadmoor Park, inviting them to come to participate in that meeting. And we'll also be promoting that via social media and the website. But that meeting is scheduled for um, the 29th of this month. Um, then we know just as recently as our last meeting, um, sort of agreed to move forward with the facility conservation improvements, uh, many of which are targeted in this building uh, and will help address issues for failing HVAC and mechanical systems. Um, the Mohawk Park restrooms and pavilion. Um, we have a grant application that we still are waiting for um, a response from the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, in terms of funding for that, but that was the number one um, priority actually going into the Mohawk conceptual planning process 
uh, and, and one of the projects that we're hoping to advance um, here in the next year or so. We also, one of the, the priorities um, in the park master plan was both park monument and wayfinding signage, both of which are currently being uh, implemented at this time and then a rebuild of Anderson tennis courts. We spent about $25,000 uh, a couple of years ago to secure the posts, um, but the tennis courts need to be completely resurfaced and you'll see um, that will be one of the proposals that comes forward uh, on the 7th. So Emily, next slide, please. So that's just kind of a, a recap. And again, uh, the one thing I didn't touch on is in terms of just acquisition, I know this council has been um, very active in kind of considerations if if finances would ever allow to consider opportunities to acquire additional green space, in particular the forest um, and some of those kinds of things. So we know that that adding green space uh, where we ha have opportunities is continues to be a priority for this council as well. well yes. Community center. Mm -hmm. I think the question was, could you, could we recap the process for determining a cost recovery goal for the community center? That's correct. And my, my question is specific to, it was that a realistic target? I mean, are we setting things up for failure basically by that decision? And should we relook at that? in terms of realistic aspect of, of trying to recover the amount that we were expecting? So the short answer to that is yes, at the time, I think that was a realistic goal. And yes, we need to revisit that, that goal in light of kind of where we, where we stand today. So um, I, we've talked before about just some of the, the policies and considerations that were made when this building was originally constructed, and then in particular with the expansion in terms of who could purchase memberships, and um, there, there were some things, I think, coming out of a consultant study, and, and all of that work predated my time here, but um, that I think weren't really focused on long-term sus financial sustainability. Um, I know that uh, it, the Parks and Recreation budget, um, when I first got here, was broken up into four different departments, um, and there was there was programming, there was administration, there was the Sylvester Powell Junior Community Center, and then I can't remember what the fourth category was. Um, and so some of those budgets were able to show that they were recovering 100% of their costs. But when you put all of that back together and say essentially parks and recreation for the city of Mission at that time was the activities centered in and around this building, we weren't, we weren't recovering 100% of those costs. And so probably in about the 2005, 2006 timeframe, the subsidy that was required to support the operations here at the community center was just continuing to grow. Um, and we were, they were recovering somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 50 to 60% of the cost. That obviously wasn't sustainable. So um, we did a lot of work, we did a lot of benchmarking. At that point, we were still one of the few kind of standalone community centers in the metropolitan area. There weren't a lot of um, comparison benchmarks. Uh, but we looked at that, we looked at some nationwide data and uh, established a cost recovery goal of about 80% um, for the facility at that time. Um, we took advantage, I think, of some low hanging fruit and we were able really within about an 18 month period to turn around that cost recovery rate and, and reach that 80% cost recovery. So, and then we were able to really kind of sustain that. Now, the, the one piece that wasn't included was capital and deferred maintenance at this facility. So that was strictly operations um, you know, for this building. Um, the pool, as we know, is never going to be self-sufficient, right? Um, we, I think we've seen some improvements with the upgrades that we made in 2014. But what we saw is we were able to really um, maintain and sustain that cost recovery somewhere typically on an annual basis between you know 75 and that 80 percent target which felt um, 
which felt pretty good. And that was even including, you know, increases in wages and benefits. And obviously this building, like all of our other departments, the, the big driver is personnel. Um, so we were having success there. We we had a, actually a task force that was formed back in 2015 to look at trying to push us to 100% cost recovery. Um, and that was not a sustainable, that was not a sustainable goal. We, I think we identified again, some other opportunities for that. Um, we were able then at that point in time, it, there was Matt Ross, there were some other community centers that, that would come online, had come online, um, but getting to that 100% just really wasn't a realistic goal. What we saw then kind of following that study is with the opening of Planet Fitness and some other things we've seen a, a decrease in and, and a decline in, in revenues. And so that was occurring even before the pandemic. Um, we've been looking at and evaluating, you know, who, who are we? What is our market niche? Who should we be targeting? How can we improve those programs? Um, and that's work that has to has to really continue and I think come back and reevaluate um, what is our goal and objective for this building and, and this facility in the longer term. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of where where we are. Um, this next slide. Um, oh no, back up one, please. Thank you. So what we wanted to do, I know, um, and and There'll be more detail around all of this, but I think there was an appetite for conversation this evening around kind of a potential timeline for park improvements uh, and potential renewal of the sales tax, as well as kind of a conversation around, do we want to tackle park outdoor park improvements through debt financing? Do we want to do that on a pay-as-you-go basis or some combination thereof? And one of the things that um, we'll highlight this evening is as we've kind of stepped back and staff has taken the opportunity to look at it, I think a hybrid, so a combination of, of bond financing and pay-as-you-go improvements probably makes sense. And so um, we'll come back and talk about that. But I think last year, um, as we were talking about the conceptual park planning processes uh, and thinking about um, an overarching budget or amount that we might be reasonable to spend in our outdoor park system and outdoor park network, we kind of threw out a, a figure of about $10 million um, divided among the city's uh, eight parks. As you know, many of those are larger parks, much more substantial improvements. At, that, at the point where we were sort of talking about that $10 million number, we were far enough along in the Mohawk conceptual planning process that we had identified about three and a half million dollars of improvements for that park. Now that was everything from the actual construction of the amenities to design and site work and all of those kinds of things. So that was all in. And we used that as kind of the benchmark as the park with, with the exception of Streamway, but the park with the most acreage and the least amount of existing amenities. Because essentially after Mohawk was acquired, um, and there was in the packet, I, there was some conversation at the time it was acquired about actually keeping the school building intact and turning that into a second uh, kind of recreation center or senior center. Ultimately, that uh, did not move forward. So that building was demolished. The playground structure was the playground structure that existed with the school. Um, and we did go in the walking trail in Mohawk Park was not in great condition when we acquired that. So we did go in. Um, I believe in 2015, and we spent about $75,000 to resurface that walking trail. But um, short of that, there um, really haven't been any amenities or improvements made uh, in that park. Um, so we, again, we use that as kind of the benchmark and then said, okay, if we step down, Broadmoor is probably the, the, neck, the park where we would spend the next you know, highest amount of money, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of two to two and a half million. Um, Anderson already has a lot of amenities between the pool, um, playground structures, shelters, with the redo and kind of maintenance on the tennis courts. Um, we, there's probably not a lot of new, there's not space to add a lot of new amenities in that park. 
Um, that is also a park that was developed in the past with land and water conservation grant funds. And so anytime we make uh, improvements or add amenities or subtract amenities from that par park, we have to go ask the permission of the state uh, in order to make any changes. So grant funding is, is good, but it always has some string attached. Um, and then Waterworks, as you know, is not a park that we own. We lease that park from the Water District, uh, and it um, will have limited opportunities in terms of the amenities that can be added there just based on the facilities that exist in terms of underground storage tanks and 30-inch uh, transmission mains serving um, really the entirety of Northeast Johnson County. So as Waterworks kicks off um, with their stakeholder group tomorrow evening, one of the things that we've been sure to do is include representatives from, from Water One to make sure that at the outset of that conceptual planning process, they talk about not only um, what they have in place, but what their plans are um, over the next probably 10 to, you know, maybe tw as far as 20 year horizon. So that as that stakeholder group is making decisions and thinking about amenities and improvements to that park, that we're able to do so in a way that um, we, we aren't spending dollars that will come back and be ripped out um, because Waterworks has, has a plan for something. So, Laura, yes. Laura can, can you clarify that? If we are leasing that from them, mm -hmm. how do we dignify the, the spending of money from this city for something that we're leasing? How do, how do we do that? Well, I mean, I think it was an opportunity. I mean, if you think about what's there, you have a playground structure and you have a shelter and you have a backstop um, and then the walking path. And I think it's proximity. I mean, I think the creating the space, and I don't, I, I don't know because that happened before me, but my guess is you had the opportunity to, to create and enhance some green space and to create a neighborhood park. Um, but if you think about the location of the existing playground structure and shelter, those are pulled to the front you know, to the front of the park. Um, so they're not sitting on top of existing amenities um, or storage tanks or any of the infrastructure that, that Water One has there. But I think that's certainly something that, that will and should limit the conversations about ongoing or future investments in, in Waterworks Park. Have we had any dialogue with them about potentially donating that park to the city since we've maintained it? Uh, they would not do that. And I think, I think as that comes forward, I mean, that it, it is, it, it is a significant piece of their delivery system for this part of the county. And I think um, once, once Water One makes that presentation to the stakeholder group, um, certainly we can share that with the rest of the council so that we have that better understanding, but it's, it's absolutely not an asset that they would deed over or even allow us to purchase. They just don't have any place else to store and, and transmit um, and provide water supply for the residents in this area. Uh, Laura, in addition to the residents, the surrounding residents and then the Water One representatives, have we invited anyone from Rushton? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Yes, they could. They'd have an angry mob of children, though. They they probably need to give us some notice, but and we can pull that lease that lease agreement back up. But is essentially, yeah. And I, I think that's absolutely a consideration. Um, you know, for example, in, in some of the past uh, master planning processes, people have talked about restrooms in that park, um, right? And I, you know, there's anecdotal stories about the boys' bush and the girls' bush that the kids use, you know, when they're, when they're in the park and it's not the real thing, you know? Um, but restrooms are something that would be really challenging to add to that park just because of, of the other infrastructure. And that's an investment. So we've, we've done some upgraded sort of porta potties um, for the last couple of years. But I think that that is, again, um, an amenity that probably would never make sense to add, you know, to Waterworks Park. The other thing is the parking is so limited there, right? We're, we don't have the opportunity unless you were to purchase 
um, residential properties on either side to even expand the parking. So we were just saying you that. think Pat would do he might donate I don't know um, but obviously it's a very you know um, the other thing to think about as we move through the process with waterworks is we know that that the um, school district has approached us or initiated conversations with water one in particular about using some portion of that park for lay down for construction activity as a part of the Rushton rebuild. And so that's certainly something that we'll want to be sensitive to and cognizant of as we plan and budget for anything that we might do uh, in Waterworks Park and, and trying to coordinate that. Um, Streamway Park, um, and, and I'll go through, but I'm just gonna jump into the timeline because I'm kind of bouncing all over and we'll get to Streamway a little bit later. but. Kind of in thinking about how we want to approach this, um, as we mentioned, we're in June of 2021, Waterworks Steering Committee is formed and kicking off Broadmoor Public Meeting number one is happening next week and is scheduled uh, to wrap up with kind of final conceptual plans um, by September of this year. So I think we can move pretty quickly. The Mohawk process was slowed. Um, dramatically by COVID, but the opportunity now to um, meet in person and advance some of that uh, and, and all of the conceptual plans that will be presented um, for the Broadmoor Park improvements include the dog park concept and a variety of other things. Um, and so the, the interesting thing is we're gonna probably need to take away. There's a lot that's been programmed into that park. Um, and so that's, how we will approach that first public meeting about, you know, here are options and, and some potential layouts, but really start to identify and whittle down those priorities. Um, in August, by, by the time we get to August of 2021, 20, but really starting on the 7th, um, you'll see us bring back a proposal to rebuild, essentially rebuild the Anderson tennis courts, including um, the installation of new lighting. Uh, that's got, um, spoiler alert, I guess, it's about a $286,000 price tag in order to be able um, to do that, um, but gets that amenity sort of back up and um, functional. Um, it's amazing the amount of usage that it gets in the condition that it's in. Um, and then uh, also looking at the Mohawk uh, restrooms and pavilion and, and planning for the budget to kick that off, um, at least phase one of that in the 2022 budget. As we move into the third and fourth quarters of this year, um, both the Broadmoor and the Waterworks Park's conceptual design processes are expected to be completed. Um, if we look at uh, a renewal of the sales tax early in 2022, so that we can then really start to effectively plan for implementation, uh, we would need in the third or fourth quarter of this year to approve that ballot language and, and move that forward. I had finally was able to catch up with the election commissioner this afternoon, um, and certainly we could do a mail ballot election in the first quarter of 2022. Their preference would be January. Uh, the Olathe School District is um, has a mail ballot issue going forward in January, and they would like just for efficiency of their staff to be able to coordinate those, they would they would consider February or March, but their preference would be January. That requires us to approve that ballot language about 90 days in advance. So we would be in an October timeframe um, coming back and, and looking at um, language for that. If we don't hit that first quarter, then you're going to be back in based on the schedule that they laid out if if we want a mail ballot election probably September and I think that that's a late um, you know that really I think holds up a lot of the decisions and conversations that we've been having and the, and the things that we want to see advance mm -hmm. just as a point of clarification so we'd be looking at a September 2021 mail ballot for our upcoming sales tax renewal, and then turning around and doing another one four months later for Parks and Rec. Potentially, yeah. If you wanted to stretch them out, then the next window, again, 
um, for a mail ballot election is going to be um, a September of 2022 time frame. But so we, they're close. Yeah. Um, we could theoretically do March and have a six month gap. Yes, if we talk nice to the election commission, we could probably finesse that. Um, so again, you know, I mean, I think that's part of the question and that's, we weren't comfortable, you know, renewing a capital improvement sales tax in this, this coming September and, and understand that. But I think part of our consideration is how close, uh, you know, do we want those two um, elections? I do think that, um, that if we get through Mohawk, Broadmoor, and Waterworks Conceptual Park planning, one of the questions, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, is does that give you, as a governing body, enough comfort level and kind of being able to map out and, and communicate and telegraph how those new sale, parks and recreation sales tax dollars would be used, particularly as it relates to outdoor parks, um, and, that, and then we would let Streamway kind of lag uh, behind and we'll touch on that here in just a minute. So quarter three and quarter four of 2021, we would then move into final design uh, for Mohawk restrooms and, and pavilions. So we have conceptual design and then it takes um, probably somewhere between four and six months, um, probably closer to four months to get us to the final design stage where we would have construction documents and we would be able to go out and bid uh, for improvements for the, the uh, park. Um, you'll also see in quarter three and quarter four, a recommendation to host another pop-up dog park event at Broadmoor. Um, the rationale for that being that you would be, if we're going for a quarter one in 2022 sales tax, you've been through your conceptual planning process. We're assuming that the dog park is going to hold um, as a part of the Broadmoor park improvements. And that would give you an opportunity to really go out and promote um, to the public and the participants in a pop-up event. Here's what we've got, here's the plan, we're on for sales tax renewal and you would be able to communicate the timeline. And I think that keeps it, that out in front of, of the public. Moving into the first quarter of 2022, um, we would look at then final design for those Broadmoor Park improvements, uh, bidding of the Mohawk Park phase one, and then the special mail ballot election to renew the Parks and Recreation sales tax. So the remainder of the timeline uh, as noted on this slide is contingent then on renewal of the parks and recreation sales tax in that first quarter of 2022. So if we're successful in that renewal, then first quarter into second quarter of 2022, we would be able to look at bringing forward financing scenarios for um, Broadmoor and Mohawk phase two. So as we look at um, the parks, even where we are in the conceptual planning stages now, the biggest investments at this point are going to be in Mohawk and Broadmoor parks. And I think probably somewhere in the neighborhood between the two of four and a half to $5 million. So if we know we have the sales tax renewed, um, we could at that point put together a financing package and look at financing the second phase of Mohawk and potentially all of the Broadmoor Park improvements um, because we would know that we would have that repayment source. If it, your debt service on that is going to be roughly what it is on the pool, so about $500,000 a year. So if you renew the sales tax at the same rate, you're, you still have some flexibility and some funds available for other parks and recreation amenities. You still are supporting to a certain extent this building and the, the outdoor pool. So that provides some flexibility. As we've talked about and just touched on with waterworks and in some of the smaller parks, um, I, I think the improvements that are there are going to make more sense to be completed on a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, and so that would be something that we would look at. So I think, again, that's that hybrid approach of saying, let's let's think about you know having that strong, more you know, more immediate visual impact in the larger parks using the debt financing. And then um, we can be very, you know, thoughtful in terms of spreading improvements and amenities around throughout the other parks. Jim? Yes. When we get ready to go out with sales tax scenarios, 
I, I highly recommend that we use a marketing strategy with the general public about where we have asked for grants for matching funds on any kind of park projects or any kind of amenities of that nature. Anytime we've maybe even categorized by where we've gotten other funds, where we've had partnerships or contributions. So it's not just this is what you get for this money, but not only are we going forward, but we have people in the community that have either signed on to partner with us or we've gotten matching grant funds from other entities. I think it's really important how we communicate to the public at large what their money's being spent on. When I hear four and a half million dollars at a park, I, I mean, that is, that's mind blowing to me as a council member, more or less as, a, as a, just a constituent. And I think we have to be really cognizant of the co constituents opinions about how the, their money is being spent. I think it's real important. I'd like to get a listing of every time we're going out for grants. I would be willing to sit forward. I evaluated grants for years to see what's out there for the general population to understand how their money's being spent because we're looking at this as a matching vehicle. We're looking at somebody's gonna donate equipment. Anytime we can get like that, it, it's showing where money's being used and how we're doing it wisely, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think part of the part of the the challenge is a little bit of a chicken and an egg scenario. So to typically to be successful in the grant application process, you need to be able to have that full conceptual. So that's the conceptual design at Mohawk, for example, is what elevated us and I think put us in a really strong position to be considered for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of, of financing and grant dollars. And so, getting some of these other parks and some of those amenities to that point where we can attach the conceptual plan and be able to say either we're doing it all at one time or this is our phased approach helps support that grant application. So we have that in some instances and I think by this fall we're going to be closer in others um, but totally agree in, in terms of you know and, and what we were did in the previous sales tax um, election for the streets was we talked about the dollars that we would raise through that sales tax and how that would be used to leverage other dollars, whether the, those are grant funds or other things. And so that is always an important part of whatever communication that we have with, with our constituents and residents around um, a, a sales tax renewal. So then moving into the second quarter of next year, um, the recommendation that we're going to make uh, in two weeks for the rebuild of An Anderson Tennis Court is to do that with 2021 budget dollars. We're sitting on fund balance and in the Parks and Recreation sales tax. The question on that will be if if the council approves that, can we a get a contractor and get on their schedule, and will the weather allow us to accomplish that in 2021? If and so that's why you see in our hope would be to do it this year, but if we can't get it done this year for those factors, again, assuming the council approves that, we would look to bring that rebuild back in the second and third quarter uh, of 2022, looking to start construction of Mohawk phase one, which is essentially restrooms and, and a pavilion structure. And then you'll see here a, a recommendation for a second pop-up dog park event at Broadmoor. Um, ideally, that would be after approval of your sales tax. And I think would, you could have the opportunity to really leverage um, fundraising um, and, and sponsorship opportunities. I know there's been a lot of conversation around that over the last several years. So again, keeping that that idea um, out in front of the constituents and the public that that's coming. Third quarter of 2022, we would bid the Broadmoor Park improvements again. Um, thought being there that uh, rather than trying to phase um, the improvements, that if we could move forward with the financing that we would just tackle all of those Broadmoor Park improvements at one time. Um, Two reasons, I think, you know, there are pieces that could probably be done in phases, including the dog park. The question would be if, if we can keep this timeline pretty close, um, do we want to move something forward and then potentially have to close it because of construction of other improvements in the park? And it's just gonna depend. I mean, that's, that's a question that we won't know the answer to until we get 
a couple more months down the road this year, and we really know what those final amenities are going to be in Broadmoor Park. Uh, and then reviewing Waterworks conceptual plan and looking at potential pay, pay as you go improvements uh, for the 2023 budget and other, other park maintenance amenities. I mean, we know we're gonna have ongoing uh, responsibility for trails, uh, walking path maintenance, um, fences, you know, all the really boring stuff that um, nobody, that, that's important, but, um, and we've, we've refocused efforts there. I think we've talked a lot about, you know, Penn took uh, a full-time, an existing full-time position here and has refocused that on our outdoor parks. And so just having someone that on a regular basis is there paying atten attention to maintenance items, identifying those, being able to tackle some smaller projects, uh, is beneficial and we, we hope to grow that. Again, that was another recommendation in the master plan about let's establish some basic park maintenance standards and then figure out um, can we accomplish that with the resources that we have or will we need to ask for additional resources in the future from a budget standpoint in order to be able to meet those standards. Quarter four of 2022, um, we've sort of outlined initiating the conceptual planning process for Streamway Park. Again, Streamway is a park that we don't own. It's KDOT right of way. Um, I doubt that KDOT is ever going to come back and take that. I mean, it's, it's up on top of the hill. Um, but again, similar to Waterworks, we don't control that. The other issue we know we have at Streamway is that it's a private street that provides access into that park. And so, um, you know, and, that, and that's one of the questions that I, I think they have for us this evening is, you know, would we be comfortable sort of deferring that conceptual planning? Can we focus the efforts on Mohawk and Broadmoor, are really the two largest parks that we do know we have control and will continue to have control over, bring waterworks along, um, you know, on a more limited basis, and then really wait until we get into next year to start to build out plans. Uh, for Streamway Park. I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, KDOT, it's KDOT right-of-way. And so I think one of the other things that we would need to really consider there is if we're going to make investments in that park and increase activities in that park, we need to seriously consider taking over that street and making that private street a public street. And so there will be an expense associated with that. And then, um, Quarter one of 2023, uh, we would be constructing, uh, under this scenario, we would have issued uh, debt and we would then move to construction of the Broadmoor Park improvements and the Mohawk, Mohawk improvements phase two. So I didn't build out, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't build out the, um, the timeline any further than that because I think this kind of hopefully gives you a, a sense of, of maybe the direction that, that we would head and again, until we know if we have that sales tax renewed um, contingent on a, on a lot of other things. So next slide, please. Let's see if I have it in my presentation. Oh. Laura, as it stands right now, mm -hmm. Streamway Park and Waterworks Park are being maintained by the owners. I like if there's any pits or holes or anything in it, the, the owner of the KDOT or Water One takes care of that? No, we, takes... we are responsible for maintenance of that. Okay, and that's in our lease agreement? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just, I just wanna say, I, I, I agree with everything, but I just, I really hesitate to exclude Waterworks just because of how much it's used by Rushton kids. Um, yeah, I don't think we're excluding it. I think we're, yeah, I mean, I think we'll be, you'll have a sense, well, I think two things. You'll have a sense by, by December of this year, the, the stakeholder group will be through, well, will be through that whole process. We'll be through the steering committee and the public meetings on water work. So you'll know what you want to do. And then there may be, and then I think we have to say, what, what do we wanna do? And then what timing makes sense? Again, what's gonna go in there? And then how does that relate to the con rebuild of Rushton, right? Because you don't want to, you know, it's just going to depend on what amenities we end up with. So you want to coordinate that. But I do think, for example, a new playground structure could be something that could go in on a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, that would, it, that's at the front of the park, likely not something that would be impacted. Um, 
because that whole area during that construction period, I think the usage on that park is going to change, you know, really change dramatically. And so I think that's, that's one of those things that um, we'll want to just really keep an eye on and factor in. And so how, not that we neglect that, but we want to time that in a way that keeps it safe. Yes. Um, along those same lines, if, if the conceptual planning changes in terms of, of the, of how a park is conceptualized. So, you know, waterworks, for example, isn't gonna take a lot more, as much energy or work or et cetera, as say Mohawk is, you know, does our contract with Confluence allow for that flexibility that we don't have to, you know, pay $7,000 for Streamway if we're not gonna do anything or for waterworks if all we're gonna do is replace a playground. I think there's some degree, yeah, I think there's some degree of flexibility. So those are maximum contractual amounts. And then we look at the actual hours that are spent on those. So there's that opportunity to scale some of that back. Okay, so then um, really quickly, the last slide I would like to go through and then open it up for kind of more discussion around this um, or, or any of these topics. Um, Again, we've kind of touched on this, but what's our comfort level? How much of the conceptual park planning processes do we feel like we need to have completed before we're comfortable going out and asking for renewal of the parks and recreation sales tax? Um, once we have renewal of the sales tax, would we consider that hybrid approach, um, that combination of bonds and pay-as-you-go financing for outdoor park improvements? If we are not successful in getting the land and water conservation grant funds secured for Mohawk, are we still committed to building out phase one, which includes the restrooms and the pavilion um, with existing dollars that are available in the Parks and Recreation Sales Tax Fund? Uh, one of the things that we'll need to think about is adequate debt service reserve. Um, excuse me, for the MFAC debt service. So the Parks and Recreation sales tax, the number one priority in the resolution that was passed is um, for use of those funds is, is payment of debt service. Now we're sitting on a pretty healthy fund balance in that fund right now. We don't anticipate major impacts in terms of a reduction in sales tax revenues over the next couple of years. But I think um, one of the things that you'll see us in a couple of weeks recommending is strategically we also need to maintain some comfort level, right, with with a reserve or a fund balance so that if we do see a de decrease, we need to make sure that by September of every year, we have $500,000 available to us to make the debt service payment. So trying to find kind of that that balance in, in the mix. Um, one of the things that was part of the conversation when the 3.8 cent sales tax was implemented was trying to build um, building reserve funds for both the outdoor pool and this building, um, trying to mitigate the big swings in the future for major systems and equipment failures and or replacements. Now, we have some of that built up. Um, we also know that through the FCIP program, we're likely going to take the opportunity for those big you know, peaks and valleys or spikes and expenses off the table for the, the next few years. But part of that fundamental question, I think, is do we want to think about either with the existing parks and recreation sales tax or going forward, um, what is an appropriate level of reserves and building reserves to maintain? That's something that wasn't done when this facility was originally built. Um, and I think it is important to, to think about um, as we move forward. So, you know, it, what is that amount? Perhaps it's not what it has been historically um, because we are taking care of some of those larger expenditures. And then kind of the question of um, in the next couple of months, do we want to make any upfront capital contribution um, to the FCIP program from that parks and recreation sales tax, recognizing that the lion's share of those improvements are occurring at this building and that is the revenue stream that um, that would have paid for those. And I know, you know, the council's had questions about, you know, whether, you know, or why that wasn't budgeted for in previous, you know, five-year CIPs. So that's a question that I think we can answer um, 
we can make we can make the debt service payments and we'll we'll be coming back to you in that September timeframe with financing on that FCIP program, but that's certainly something else um, to think about. So I thought um, that's probably everything we have um, from the staff perspective to present on parks and recreation. So maybe pause there. I know that um, council member Thomas and Schlossmacher provided a memo with some uh, additional thoughts on funding and financing and timing for the dog park. So I don't know if one, one, of, one or both of you wanna kind of share or talk about that and then we can certainly open up for any other kind of discussion or direction around some of these parks issues and then we'll talk about Senate Bill 13. Sure, thanks Laura. I'm gonna let Nick kick things off, but thank you. Sure, um, in the memo that was provided, um, I know it just got out this afternoon, so I'm sure we probably all haven't had a time, too much time to look at it, um, but we wanna kind of review some of that. And one of the things that's provided there was a, was a letter that I thought was a really great thing to, uh, to review here from Christina Farmer, who has been the head of our dog park committee. Um, she's been involved in the process since before I got elected. Um, and she wrote a pretty, pretty heartfelt letter. So I wanted to read that here. So I'll, uh, I'll go here. Dear Mission City Council members, I was excited to hear that your city council work session includes discussion about the possibility of a dog park admission. I was also disheartened when I heard that the prospect of budgeting for a dog park in 2022 is once again delayed. My name is Christina Farmer. I'm a native of the Kansas City metropolitan area and a seven year mission resident. A first time homeowner, a Cerner employee, a Zumba instructor at the Powell Community Center and a dog mom to a sweet and playful six year old, 100 pound Great Pyrenees Golden Retriever. Uh, one of my favorite activities is taking my dog, Indiana Bones, to dog parks to watch him run. However, we don't get to go very often due to the fact that there are no dog parks in Northeast Johnson County. When the weather's nice, I hurry home from work, Indy jumps in the car, we make the minimum 30 minute round trip via the highway to the nearest dog park, either St. John's in KCK or Penn Valley in KC Mo before it gets dark. My dream is to be able to take Indy to a nearby dog park without driving on the highway, without rushing to beat the sunset. I know many other residents of Mission share my dream, especially the dog owners without backyards. To echo council members Sloshmacher and Thomas's memo, over 50% of Mission residents reside in apartments and or rental properties. In January, 2016, so almost six years ago, I wrote a letter to the former mayor of Mission and city council members listing the drive time and distances to all the nearest dog parks from my house. Closest was eight miles and about 15 minutes via the highway. I compared the dog park drive times and distances with a list of pet centered businesses. Eight businesses were within one mile or less of my house and they're all still in business. I received several responses to my letter. Council, member, council members assured me Mine was not the first request they heard for a dog park and they assumed it would not be the last. In 2018, I was invited to attend the first Friends of Mission Dog Park Committee meeting. The Mission Parks and Rec Department created the committee after a task force spent a year researching the possibility of building a dog park in the city. The department determined the city needed to use the parks and recreation budget to update the existing park amenities and they entrusted the Friends of Committee with calculating the cost of installing dog park structures and facilities fundraising to build and maintain a new dog park and finding a suitable location. With Gusto, the Friends of, um, the Friends of Mission Dog Park Committee rebranded to Mission Dog Park. Word about our volunteer committee spread, more mission residents started attending meetings and Springboard Creative on Johnson Drive created a professional logo for us pro bono. We met with representatives of other Northeast Johnson County cities about available land and possible partnerships, took a mini road trip to Ottawa, Kansas and Franklin County to visit with the Parks and Recreation Director and learn how their city fundraised and built a dog park using private donations. We met with the city of Kansas City, Kansas, who were recipients of the 2018 Pet Safe Bark for Your Park grant and visited their new St. John's Dog Park. Our fondest memory as a committee was the pop-up dog park event that we planned and executed in October of 2018. Put up a temporary six foot chain link fence around a half acre space in Broadmoor and threw a party to create awareness for and celebrate the possibility of finally bringing a dog park to Mission. We had a DJ, Werner's Fine Sausages food truck, which sold hot dogs, 10 vendors from various dog center businesses, a photo booth with a professional photographer. Nearly 300 dogs attended and over 40 entered the dog costume contest. It was a blast and the excitement from the attendees was electric. Um, in 2019, Christy Humerichaus, who was our former Parks and Rec director, unexpectedly resigned and the committee's efforts were halted. 
Later in 2019, mission appointed Penn Albany who needed time to, to onboard. Then coronavirus happened. Everything was put, a hold, put on hold again until July of 2020 when Penn attended one of the outdoor Zumba classes at Anderson Park and the dog park discussion resumed. In the beginning of 2021, I attended two Broadmoor, Broadmoor Park steering committees facilitated by Mr. Almany, where we viewed possible designs for the park created by the landscape architecture company Confluence. I was beyond ecstatic when all the designs included a dog park. I thought our, our hard work was finally paying off and it was actually happening. In spring of 2021, I attended another meeting with Director Almany, City Administrator Laura Smith, Council Members Hillary Thomas and Nick Sloshmacher. We discussed the plan for a dog park in Broadmoor for the entire meeting. And I left with the task of filling out the application for the 2021 PetSafe Bark for Your Park grant, in which PetSafe will grant up to $25,000 for dog parks. I've been working on the Bark for Your Park application, which is due one week from today. And I recently learned the city is recommending that plans for a dog park admission are being pushed to later than 2022. To say that I'm disappointed is an understatement, but I can't say that I'm surprised. I've loved getting to know the representatives of Mission during the past five years, However, my faith in the city government has severely dwindled. My experience in leading the Mission Dog Park group has been the same the entire time. Work hard to take one step forward, then get shoved two steps back. When I sent my letter to the city of Mission in 2016, my dog was seven months old, or was a seven month old clumsy puppy. Now his black fur is starting to turn gray and next year he'll be considered a senior dog. I wonder if he'll ever get to visit the Mission Dog Park in his lifetime. And I wonder if I will still be a Mission resident by the time there is a dog park if it ever happens. I'm only one story. I've engaged with so many enthusiastic residents willing to voluntarily put in the hard work of making our wonderful city a little bit better. My excitement during Steps Forward is shared by hundreds of dog owners and my disappointment and discouragement during the Steps Backward is also multiplied several hundred fold as well. I hope the day comes when I can provide a definitive answer to the weekly direct messages that are still sent to the Mission Dog Park Facebook account asking when a dog park is finally going to arrive in Mission. Thanks for your time. Sincerely, Christina Farmer, Mission Dog Park Chair. Um, I can say that, you know, I've participated along with her throughout this whole process and, and I echo some of those sentiments. Um, I, I do feel like along the way we've been, we've had process pushed on us that maybe wasn't ever clearly defined. We get momentum and then for whatever reason, something always comes up, pushes it back further. Um, and here we are six years later, and I really don't feel like we're that much closer than we were when I got elected. Um, and that was one of my goals when, when I was running for, for council was to try to bring a dog park to the city. Um, what I would like to see and what I would like us to consider as a council is since we know that the dog park is going to be part of the conceptual plans at Broadmoor, um, it's most likely gonna be there. I, I don't think at this point, it's as much of a question of if we ever get one, it's more of a question of when. And I would like to see us allocate the money in this budget for 2022 to start the creation of the dog park and pull that piece of the Broadmoor Park design forward. Um, I think we'd be looking for around $100,000 as well as allowing us to then um, apply for that grant, which is due on June 30th. Um, I've personally had some conversations just again this afternoon with some business owners who are also looking to see if they can partner with us in some sort of a a public-private partnership to help sponsor things. Whether that's some of the build-out or ongoing maintenance, we still have to you know, obviously discuss some of that. Um, but I think it's an opportunity for us to, to take something that we know is an amenity that a lot of the community wants. Uh, it would be very beneficial. There's something that anybody, you know, communities for all ages could use. Um, and I think we have an opportunity here. We have excess fund balance to set that money aside, earmark it, have it available so we can try to pull that piece of the project forward and show some tangible stuff that we can point to as we go to renew this sales tax. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I'm sure other people have questions or comments as well. Um, if you, if, go ahead, oh. go ahead. I would be in full support of moving forward with this, but I was also curious as to, can you expand on the application process and what they would need from us and just a little more on that? Um, Sure, Hillary, maybe you Yeah, I can speak a little, a little bit more to that. that. The, um, the grant application itself is pretty simple. I think the only factor that as a council, um, we'd need to jump on um, a conversation around would be maintenance um, and committing and having an understanding of what maintenance of the dog park would look like because they're looking for a description of that. 
The second piece would be a commitment to public use of the dog park. So not allowing for memberships, et cetera, and making sure it's open to the general public. And so those are, you know, two things that, you know, we really can't act upon without having the conversation with council and making sure, you know, city staff and, and ultimately we really need council and city staff's permission to get this grant application um, underway. And um, I'm, I'm not married to submitting the grant application this year just because of the, the looming deadline and there could be an opportunity next year to do the same, but I don't think that separates from the sense of urgency that we share in getting the dog park underway now because there's opportunity for funding for maintenance or improvement or amenities um, beyond just the construction, which we could fund initially. Um, and so I, I hope that answers your question, if yeah. you have more. I just, I had one more follow-up. So with the deadline approaching, and I know that this has been worked on, um, tremendously uh, do we have a draft of what we could um, submit for the the maintenance description and and just anything else that we need so right so but the maintenance description that they're requiring yeah we would have to submit that with the with the grant application right so um you know, it's really basic statement. It's more just, you know, as a council and as a city making the commitment to, you know, how we will use the funds and that, you know, in a year from now, we're not gonna say that the, you know, the dog park, you know, is closed except for, you know, those that have memberships, et cetera. So I think that's that operating conversation that needs to happen. I do just wanna add really quick, I'm, I'm not gonna read through our entire memo. Um, I can trust that hopefully you guys have had time Thank to you. read it. If not, um, please do. I apologize that you didn't get as much um, as time as you know, I, I'd like you, ha like you to have, but um, I just wanna add that um, Nick and I have worked really tough to work as much as we can within the process and to work um, with city staff, with Penn, with Laura, and um, really, really applaud all the work that they're doing in the conceptual planning process. This is just one of those, um, those tricky, tricky items that, that we just can't let go away for another 18, 24, 36 months, whatever it's gonna end up being. And that's not that I don't trust that we all want it to happen in quarter one, 2023, because I think we do. Um, I think it's just there's too many variables for us not to act on it actively sooner. Um, the idea of a parks and rec sales tax four to six months after uh, a sales tax mail ballot um, is concerning that the parks and rec sales tax may not renew and then it's really back to square one on all of this. And I know that a dog park will not be first priority. Um, we just it could experience general delays. There's just a lot of uncertainty in the world still right now. We don't know, you know, what quarter one 2023 could look like. And also just the change in council leadership, a change in mayor, a change in um, a variety of things. I think while we have an appetite in the community and on the council uh, to get a dog park moving forward, I think we should do it. I think it's the responsible thing to do. But I do think that there is an opportunity for some compromise here in this timeline, along with, you know, pushing this in 2022, if that means that we allocate dollars and then we somehow can, you know, find a, a middle ground in the timeline so it better aligns with the, with the conceptual plan. I'm open to that too. I just really want to stress to council that we've worked really hard over the past six, almost seven years to, um, to make this happen behind the scenes. And so we're here trying to make it happen a little bit more interactively and felt like this conversation needed to happen as a group. What's the downside of going ahead and going forward with part of the conceptual plan without doing the other part? I know that there's the pay as you go and the bonding and, you know, I'm not looking at that part, but what, I mean, is there seriously a downside on, I mean, a, a big kind of big downside because I do appreciate all the work that you guys have done. Absolutely. And the, well, and you the were, you were involved in it. Right. I you spent time right. on, on the right. committees right. as well. So, right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a couple of things, I think that based on the conceptual designs for Broadmoor, I think the location of a dog park, the, con the, the configuration. So one that's rounder and fatter, if you will, versus one that's longer and more narrow 
are kind of the two considerations in that design. I don't see that that actual location of the dog park would change uh, in relationship to other things being built out in the park. The larger question is how does, what, what are the other amenities that you might end up with and how do those interact with, you know, the location and, and movement right. in and around? Because I do think that just, I think there's some things that have to move based on those conceptual plans and where they have playgrounds shown in relationship to, you know, to dog parks. So, I don't think I don't think there's a risk necessarily there. I don't know that I don't I don't know, and we can certainly pursue how much it really would cost to move that forward. Um, you know, I think Penn had shared a number with with Councilmember Thomas and, and Schlossmarker of around a hundred thousand dollars. That that may be a little bit low, depending on because I think one of the things that that the conceptual plan and order of magnitude cost is recommending is irrigation in that dog park area, which is, I think, gonna be really critical to the long-term maintenance, particularly because one of the things that I know the task force groups determined in their evaluations was that an acre was sort of the minimum size that you would want to do for a dog park. And that we're right at an acre from what I understand with, with that conceptual plan. So making sure that we get the right pieces of that so that it it is, sustainable and attractive and and we can maintain that I think is, is going to be important so I don't know how much more than a hundred thousand dollars that you know that might be so the downside is then would you have if you move that forward depending on the other amenities would you have to then limit the access for some period of time while you did other construction in that park and I don't that that's the part that's really difficult to answer we could probably manage that Right. Um, you know, I think, um, and, and the, the only comment that I would make, I think, is, is a point of clarification. And I think that there has been a lot, I mean, if we think back to 2016, I mean, we've overcome sort of hurdles and conversations around the dog park can't be in an existing city park and we can't use any existing city dollars, dedicated parks and recreation sales tax dollars to pay for that. That's, that's been direction and guidance provided by previous councils. We're past that. I mean, I feel like we're, we're well past that and we're at the point where we, it's in a park, it's in the final conceptual plans of a park and we're not putting necessarily those strings on. So when the grant opportunity came up and, and I think if it, if it is the council's prerogative to advance that, I would say let's do that um, and hold off on the grant application. What our hope was when we had that initial meeting, we didn't, the grant application wasn't open. We couldn't see sort of submission timelines and parameters. And our hope had been that it would open up and then we would be able to at least get through the first public meeting at Broadmoor before that application was due. And the timing of that, you know, is a day, within a day right, of, right. of each other. Um, I also think that while I doubt that we would look at memberships um, for the park, um, I would rather see if it's, if it's the priority of the council to allocate those dollars and wait on a future grant application so that you have time to really think about operations longer term for that, for that dog park. Um, I don't know that you want to if, that you, if we're going to proceed with this, I don't know that we want to lock down all of those other alternatives at this point in, you know, in that discussion. What are the, the cons, I, I guess, of submitting an application and then our ability to change our mind? Or does that hurt us in any way? If we were to... You probably never get probably it. We only have one shot at it. You have so one if, shot if we got at it. it and change our mind, then we... You know, okay. wouldn't ever be qualified for it again, okay. but um, that, that's the downside to it. And I know that we were talking about considerations we'd have to make, but I mean, we just talked about we've spent years and I feel like with any large project, we're always gonna have those things and we're as ready as we're gonna be, so. Here's the other thing that I, I think- I feel like that, we're about as ready as we yeah, can and, go and, and here's another thing I think we need to take into account here. We're not talking about $2 million. We're talking about 100, maybe 150. I. I I don't know, I, I'd really like to see how those numbers even come up, because I know some of the other parks that we looked at that were created were, were done for well under $100,000, but there might be other irrigation things there, I, I don't know, right? But we're certainly not talking about $2 million or you know, 
1.5 million or we're talking about a total budget of 4.5 to 5 million over these two parks. This is a small piece of that. It's a piece that's going to happen anyway. And all we're asking for is, is to commit that money, um, potentially pull it forward that. next year. And, you know, it, it, it shows some good progress towards the ultimate bigger goal. But I, I think this is something that, again, there's been overwhelming support from the community. I know not every single person is going to be super excited. You're always going to have a naysayer, but um, I, I think it'd be a, a huge improvement and uh, something that we really need to consider. Yeah, I would, ag I would agree on the comments on holding on the grant um, that Laura made, especially since there is the opportunity to apply for it for maintenance. I think, you yeah, know, we true. haven't really thought through the operation piece at all. And so restricting us ahead of time and kind of, you know, rushing to get that application in doesn't seem like the best plan to me since we would still have that, you know, opportunity in a future year to apply for those funds. And relatively speaking to the whole parks project, it's a, you know, a low dollar amount. And so I would rather, you know, take take the risk and waiting in. I mean, obviously there's always a chance that grant could go away, but my understanding is it's existed. You know, this isn't its first year or anything. Um, so I would say wait on that piece. Um, on the, the timing piece, you know, I'm a big fan of the dog park. I was on the original dog park task force when, when Kristen was on it, you know, dog, dog park 1.0, I guess. Um, I am definitely open to continuing these conversations. I think for me to really wrap my head around the funding and the timing piece, it'll be helpful when we have our next meeting and see what the actual budget looks like. But I think, you know, that grant deadline was the really time sensitive piece, but we have from now until August or actually with Senate Bill 13, potentially till October to continue to have these conversations and see what makes the most sense, you know, on the timing front. So I would say, yeah, I wanna, wanna hear more and see what the other pieces look like, but 100% behind a dog park. And, and let me just, I forgot to mention earlier that I did, I mean, we know the Direction Finder survey is out there. And one of the questions that we asked on Direction Finder was about, you know, prioritization for a dog park. We didn't ask location, but um, I had a, an email late last night from ETC and we are well over our 400 response rate already, which means we've got statistically valid survey. They're going to keep that. You may have seen we did a push on social just reminding people if you have the survey, please turn it back in. So they're going to keep that survey open through the end of um, the first week of July, end of next week, basically. So through the first of July, and then they will, we will have the, the week of July 12th, we'll have results from the direction finder back. So again, as we continue through our budget discussions, we'll have information on a whole variety of topics, including kind of park amenities and improvements available. And that was our other hope that we would be able to have that timely as a part of our budget discussions. So I forgot, I failed to mention that earlier. I think, you know, philosophically, that's what we're looking at. We can get into the details and the weeds and the money and how it does. I think philosophically, I think the majority of the council supports this and supports the task force and all their efforts to date. I have some detailed information I've had concerns about, like if we don't have that many parks, are we gonna have all of Kansas City, Missouri over here? I mean, but those are aftermath questions and comments. I'd like to know what percentage of the park is taken by the dog park. Um, I want a balance. I live, that's the end of my street. Right. I want a dog park. I think a dog park's great. It, it brings forth families. Families can interact with their kids and their dogs and it's wonderful. I, I want a balance there though. That park's been used for so many wonderful things and I wouldn't want it to be taken over. I'd also want information down the road on maintenance. Who's going to maintain it? You know, those detailed things can come about later. I support the dog park and we'll be supporting it one way or another. And it's not a finale. If it doesn't work, we don't use it anymore. It can be put back. It's not like you structured a building like this and then, okay, it doesn't work. We'll have to take it all down. It doesn't work like that. I think right. it's amenable. I think the people have done their homework and a lot of people are supportive of it. And I am certainly supportive of it and look forward to moving forward. I'd be willing to bet just about anything. If it doesn't work, it's because we've gotten overrun and too many people are trying to go there and use it. And we have to come up with a plan to limit that. I, I think that's, that's the bigger risk right? than it not that being, was one of my questions. Not How being a well-used, well-appreciated right. amenity. Right. But we can get yeah, to the details later. Right. No, we don't. Just a, a couple other quick comments. I don't think there's ever going to 
there, there wasn't a perfect time for us to bring this forward in this budget process. And I just wanna add that we didn't know whether right now or you know, after Broadmoor's meeting or at July 7th when we, already, when we actually had the budget in front of us, we just, we didn't know the right time, but we just knew that we needed to have the conversation rather than having to wait another however long. Yeah, um, because the reality is, is we can allocate dollars now. We could still be looking at 18 months before we even break ground on it. I mean, 18, that's a long time for us to work on operating plans and maintenance plans and all the other pieces and probably most importantly the opportunity to leverage that city commitment of dollars for additional fundraising to make up whatever the gap is and so i i you know that's really the what the hope is tonight was that we continue the conversation into when we have the budget in front of us um so that we can look at you know a map of it costs etc and figure out how we could close the gap if there is one I do. Mikhail, at, at one thing, um, since Pin wasn't able to be ha here with us tonight due to travel, he's here on to, Zoom, please, I think, or it might be somewhere in Zoom land. Um, he's I in did Zoom just land. want to add that I, I did talk to him. You know, we were talking about the cost. I think Debbie was asking about how it fits with the rest of the site, that sort of thing. He, he did say he, at least as of a couple weeks ago, he hadn't got hard numbers on site work, but he thought it would be an additional 50 to 100,000 in site work for the dog park dog park piece of the Broadmoor full site. But. And we're continuing to work with Confluence on trying to break, you know, break those down and re refine those um, as well. So we'll, we'll bring that back. I think um, any other, the, the one thing I'm hearing is, you know, and we presented it in the timeline, but I think one of the things that we need to talk about a little bit more is, what is a comfort level with a timeline for renewal of the parks and recreation sales tax? Um, you know, we've, there, there's been a sense of urgency for a variety of different park improvements, um, you know, the, and, and then looking at opportunities to debt finance to have a larger impact. Um, the sooner we renew that, the sooner we can talk, you know, the, the one thing that you can be assured that I would, will never do is bring you a, proposed debt issue with no repayment source. Um, and so, you know, I think we were trying to look at is that in first quarter of 2022, maybe too soon based on some of the comments that I've heard, but I think that's something we need to explore. Definitely. Yeah, I was just gonna say too, and you know, we'll also have municipal elections in November. And so I'm just a little worried that people might be in election fatigue mode, you know, having to turn around in January and do a ballot election again in addition to already doing a mail ballot election in September. So maybe like a March timeframe, you know, even though the election people said not to, I, or, you know, their preference was a different time. I, I do think getting a favorable environment, maybe it makes sense to wait a couple months after, you know, the year begins and people can, plus, you know, people as the weather gets warmer might be thinking more favorably about the parks and the green space in addition to trying to vote too in the dead of winter. Just another thought. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing to think about is, you know, there we know there will be changes on the council, you know, um, come December of this year, and so this is a group that is at least pretty cohesive in terms of your priorities and and objectives, and so depending on how far we push that um, into you know 2022, how much time will we spend, you know, revisiting potentially with a new council. Uh, as well, and, and that's certainly the prerogative, but I think that's that's a factor. I mean, if if we went on a March timeframe, uh, I think it would be this council that would establish that ballot language um, based on the timing that the, so it would be the, a November timeframe that we would have to make a decision on that ballot language. So again, not, we don't have to decide that tonight, but I think as we think about you know, budgeting short term and longer term, um, that's going to have a significant impact on how we program things in, in a CIP that we'll bring forward. Yeah, I, I had concern about this when we were talking about the street, um, you know, uh, sales tax. And so I was thinking that we should probably combine the two in some way and now we're doing one and then doing the other one right away i think it really 
does create some confusion. Uh, I would I would suggest that we push it toward March at least, uh, and not not try to push it into January. I just had a question on the March dates. Um, I worry about spring break because I feel like a lot of our kiddo spring breakers might be our favorable voters for <laughs> a park sales tax. So will we be able to get it in, you know, early March where then we're at least, you know, six months from the prior election, but avoid spring break? Um, yes, let me, I'm trying to find the email I had from the election commission today just to kind of while you're looking, I think that, you know, we have not spoken, or at least I haven't on the dog park. I think I support all of the comments that are made. I'm kind of concerned that this was kind of just sprung on us, especially with the issue of the grant, you know, with the deadline June 30th doesn't make sense to me. I, I think we're committed to the dog park. I think we shouldn't just rush into this grant at this time. Uh, well, I, when we have the commitment to do the project overall. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I appreciate those comments. I, I think if we're willing to, to still potentially move with this without um, being tied to that grant right now, that, that puts us in an even better spot. And certainly as we've talked about that grants available, not just for creation, but for ongoing, you know, expansion or build out or maintenance of, of a dog park. So that could be something that we could revisit in the future, but um, that's part of why we still wanted to at least bring it up tonight is because of, because of that deadline, because of the work that Christina already had, had done to get that grant application you know, formulated and, and mostly ready to submit if we did go forward with it. And we want to at least have that conversation. But I know the timing is not ideal for sure. So. Yeah, and I'll just follow well said. I, I have similar thoughts too. I support the dog park, but just didn't want to cut any corners having you know six days, seven days to, to submit that. So um, sure finding a way to maybe, you know, say we're going to do it and still make sure we can kind of give it a good due diligence process to figure out the details might be, and, and then maybe reapply next year might be a better approach. Well, I, I will say on the process standpoint, um, you know, we, I know not everyone here has been involved during that whole time, but it's been a six year period of trying to work the process and kind of running into brick walls. So I, I do feel like, um, and it's great that we have, you know, potentially Q1 2023 and, and some other roadmap plans here. I do feel like if we don't move forward with this, we're going to kind of get stuck in this cycle again. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of faith that, you know, if we if we don't act now, I I, I don't have a whole lot of faith that it's going to get done in the next few years. Um, I, I, would, I, I, I would. I'm, I'm hoping. I'm yeah. hoping that we so, have the appetite to bring that up in our final budget discussions, right? And so that, that's where I'm just stressing that. I, I guess I'm I'm a little jaded with the process that we have followed for the last six years because it hasn't gotten us anywhere. So I'm hoping we can, you know, come to some consensus and, and find a way to move it forward. So I would agree, and I appreciate I, I appreciate your passion and persistence because um, I, I like lending time to our process. But when we do that and things get kicked down the road, we find ourselves at another meeting and have to re-update, and then find ourselves against another deadline. And sometimes we just, I mean, we're going to be as ready as we are with certain things. And, and I feel like we're there with this. So it's, I agree. I like more time, but I feel like we've had it. Well, I mean, just as a counter consideration, I, I don't think staff would have put it on the timeline in the public packet if they weren't serious about, you know, getting it all done in 2023. So I think we're really talking about, you know, we all seem to have, clear consensus that there's a commitment to the dog park and we're talking about 2022 or 2023. And so, yeah, I just think seeing more on the budget process and, you know, which, which year um, between those two makes sense. Not a question of if we are going to do a dog park, but, you know, slight, slight time difference, really. I, well, I, I still just want to keep in mind, like there are going to be changes to the governing body this fall, um, both on the you know, new mayor and, and some new council members. Um, who knows what's what that's going to bring going forward? Uh, I, I still think it's it's an opportunity to move on this while we kind of seem to all have some consensus on it. Um, and even if we don't end up building it till till 2023, allocating those funds will allow us to do some of the other stuff through the dog park group, like going out and soliciting you know some other partnerships and just 
when we have that firm commitment from the city that yes, this is for sure going to happen. We've already agreed to budget the money for it. it. Makes it a lot easier to have a conversation with a business owner who might be willing to donate a, a decent amount of money to, you know, help build out some piece of it if they can put their little logo on it somewhere or you know have some advertising partnerships. Maybe an ongoing maintenance, maintenance agreement with somebody or. Um, and those conversations have been happening behind the scenes. So, Nick, yep. I have yeah. just a couple final com comments. You know, I, I think part of the sense of urgency right now, additionally, um, beyond the, the grant deadline, is considering our fund balance. We do have excess fund balance right now. I'm not confident that we're going to have that same excess fund balance this time next year um, on the current trajectory we're on with the community center. And so um, that's just a, an additional sense of urgency. And this could potentially allow an actual tangible deliverable for the community prior to the parks and rec sales tax renewal. If we could, could get the ball rolling on this, at least you know the, the marketing of it, getting the community excited because this is something people have been just, I, I don't know about you guys, but hounding, hounding me about um, for so long that I think getting folks excited for that and showing that we're breaking ground and that happening right before the parks and rec sales tax renewal, whenever that timeline is, really could end up working in our favor as well. Thank one, you. One last piece I would add to that too that, that's happened kind of recently. Um, we've probably all seen some stuff in the local news about Rushton and where a lot of people were using Rushton as kind of an off-lease dog park for a while. And that's kind of been shut down now. They're, they're not gonna um, allow people and probably shouldn't be allowing people to have their dogs run around off-leash in there. So it, it again furthers that need for a space in the community where people who maybe don't have a backyard can go take their dogs, let them run around. Um, and so. It, I think the timing seems as, as right as it's gonna to get to me. So I appreciate everyone listening to us and considering this. So, so as we think about um, the budget that will come forward in a couple of weeks, do you want to target this allocation from the excess general fund fund balance or do you want to target this from parks and recreation sales tax fund balance or do you want to see both options? I, I would say see both options and also see scenarios where we do and don't get the grant for Mohawk because um, I do feel I know that's also on our discussion points and possibly related. Um, I do feel strongly that we need to make sure we're allocating the funds to do the restrooms and pavilion together at Mohawk because I think otherwise you're going to have multiple concrete pours and just get some really janky outcome there if you don't do it together quite honestly and so I think um, since L the grant process is kind of at a snail's pace um, and we might may or may not know that honestly you know during the budget cycle I do want to make sure that that is is covered first and foremost um, you know because that has also been a long-standing item I think it was 2019 maybe it was the original budget it, allocation if, on those restrooms it was but if you and if you actually go back to conversations around restrooms in Mohawk Park you could probably go back to about 2010 and also a listing you know as as we move forward a listing of in-kind services or potential partnerships established would give some I think real assurance that we're moving forward with it and we have alternative potential funding at some other point so food, let me let me just share with you kind of specifically as again kind of thinking and, and maybe can inform our conversations in a couple of weeks so the Olathe school district right now it, it, we believe or the election commission believes is going to have a mail ballot election in January of 2022 <clears throat> so ideally if we want to go in first quarter they would like us to go at the same time as um, the Olathe School District. He, he, they have said um, holding a special mail ballot election in February or March of 2022 for mission would not be desirable um, if Olathe does the January issue, but they would consider it. If the Olathe um, School District does go forward in January and mission does not also hold an election at the same time, their preference from the election commission would be then to target an election in either April, May, June, or September. 
um, for a separate standalone item. And we'll, we'll detail that. I'll detail that more in the budget memo that comes out for the 7th, but. It does seem like an April date would have still, would still allow for us to have passage in time to start our budget conversations potentially and might give us a little more time from the prior okay. date. Yeah, again, think, think about, I think, I think September is too late because of the other things that we want to do in terms of just advancing improvements in the outdoor park system. Um, but if we could go earlier, you know, again, finding that that spot to create the distance between this September's election and and then coming back with parks and recreation sales tax. Yeah, that's what I would also support that we move it, you know, toward April or whatever is not try to get on the January um, schedule. Um, but I think that, you know, we've made the commitment to do this. I think that you know, whether it's out of uh, fund balance or, or uh, out of uh, parks and recreation sales tax fund. Either way, I think that's something that staff can determine and help make that decision for us. I don't know if that's something that we necessarily need. To... We'll show you some options because again, I think there are some of those other considerations about debt service reserve. I think the Mohawk um, improvements with or without the grant obviously is going to impact the parks and recreation sales tax fund balance. So I think it just helps us know, you know, exactly what scenarios but we can I, build out for you. But I also think that we need to get into this question about the, the new status for our uh, cap, you know, the, 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 oh, the, um, the overall total sales tax Senate rate, bill, the Senate okay. bill 30, 13. So we can understand what we're, making decision on with regards to that as well. Yeah. And again, I think you'll get through at least for, um, you know, for Mohawk Broadmoor and Waterworks, by the time we get to the end of this year, you should have those kind of order, you know, higher order of magnitude costs, um, which would allow us then, um, that was, the, that was the tricky part if we were gonna have to set an election or wanted to set an election ballot question in October that, seems really rushed um, in terms of all the other conversations that we're having. I would also look at not moving out too far on this potential dog park. Some of the things it offers besides just community buy-in is small businesses being able to use sodding or fencing or things like that where they may be going under as a result of the pandemic. If we can do <clears throat> things to build small businesses back up too, I think that's a win for everybody. I would move it, whatever we do, however we fund it, that it moved before 2023. I'd like to see it go quick. Agreed. Okay, anything else around parks? If not, um, if we could go please to the slide on Senate Bill 13. Okay. So I think as we've touched on briefly, uh, Senate Bill 13 is a legislation that effectively replaces the tax lid. Um, it does, uh, it focuses more on a revenue neutral mill rate. Um, before we were focused on actual revenue um, kind of generated, it, it, they're all intertwined. Um, Senate Bill 13, while it provides some greater de degree of flexibility, also brings with it some tremendous notification requirements uh, from a public perspective, not in this particular budget year. So the, the, the notification requirements set out in the statute take effect with the 2022 tax year, which will actually be our 2023 budget or fiscal year. So while we will want to do some notification for our taxpayers if we want to exceed the revenue neutral rate in this year's budget. It will not be the same degree or level or expense associated with that notification requirement going forward. Basically what, what happens is the county identifies a revenue neutral rate for the current tax year by July 15 or June 15th. And then um, if an entity wishes to see, um, exceed the revenue neutral rate or mill levy, um, then you have to notify the county of your intent to do so. Uh, it changes uh, slightly some of your public hearing requirements, but it actually gives you a little bit uh, longer period of time than what we typically have to adopt and approve a budget. So 
it pushes that deadline out to October 1st versus um, August 25th is, had historically been the date by which we had to certify our budgets to the county clerk. So just, um, I think for us, it's pretty, pretty simple. What I've tried to show in this graph included in the presentation is just kind of what's happened to our mill, uh, mill levy rate over the last um, 20 years or so. You can see um, back in 2002, 2003, we were still at a mill levy that was just slightly over five mills. And yes, <laughs> and uh, Council Member Kring will tell you that was certainly lowest in the state of Kansas. And that's, you know, that, that was. <laughs> right? Um, and I think that's, that's why when we go back and we look at and we think about kind of that slide that talked about total assets, while that is certainly something that is great to be able to say, what did that do in terms of deferred maintenance for us for, from a street perspective and a stormwater perspective and to a certain extent, a, a parks perspective. And, um, and you as a council today and councils for the really the last 10 years or so have been having to make some really difficult choices as it relates to that. So, um, but that's a, you know, as we know, making those adjustments in the mill rate. And so when you look at these, you know, what look like incredible spikes, um, you know, I think we ju jumped up to what a whopping 10 mills or, so, or something along those lines. But then we then we had a series of trade-offs. And I think in that mill levy chart that was included and it was updated, it's updated in the packet. I didn't pick up the, the right one uh, with Audrey on Friday, but we, we played around with mill levy that we talked about earlier tonight for acquisition of Mohawk Park because the council had committed to buy the park and didn't have the funds in the bank to, to do it. So they um, issued the debt to, to finance that. And then, um, we had, so we had a, a mill in debt service. Um, then we used a mill to pay for a portion of stormwater. So as the FEMA floodplain maps were revised and more property got put in and we started to build out a plan for how we were going to address that, we started to incrementally sort of raise the mill or dedicate more to stormwater. Then streets kind of started to pick up. Um, you'll see then we traded when we had a year, you'll see the dip um, in this graph when we traded mills for stormwater utility fee increases. And so we had financed um, the stormwater improvements, um, particularly uh, associated with the gateway project and spread that out over a period of time where debt service would in theory be um, manageable. And so there was a really dramatic increase uh, in the stormwater utility fees. And so the council at that point wanted to, to balance that um, you'll see in the in the chart that was provided, there was also a decision made at one point to increase the mills and then declare a moratorium on a mill levy increase for four years. So um, that you know that there there have been all of these trade offs, um, and will there will continue to be trade offs in, in the budget process. Um, and I think that's why I think we've done and, and we're much better positioned, although I know it's it's still um, frustrating to feel like we have so much ground to continue to make up with respect to deferred maintenance. But even though I know it doesn't feel like I think we're all sitting in a much better position than we were 10 years ago um, in terms of plans and options and knowing how and, and where to make some of um, those trade offs. But long story short, Revenue, uh, current mill rate is 17.048. The revenue neutral rate for 2021 tax year is 16.3. So you can see that if we don't um, express our desire or intent to exceed that, um, the difference uh, is about $135,000 in additional revenue that we would leave on the table in the 2022 budget. Um, that breaks down for an average homeowner, uh, average home price in Mission is about $248,000. So for an average homeowner in Mission, that ability to exceed or desire to exceed the revenue neutral rate is $22 a year, about $1.83 a month. So I think I've heard generally a sentiment to wish to maintain the mill at the, at the current level. Um, if that's, and, and again, we can talk, we'll talk about this on the 7th. We just need to notify the county by July 20th 
of our intent and it's just simply a, a notification and then um, we could extend the, the time period um, to look at that. So I see. Yes, right now, and then you have to provide the notice. You have to provide the notice and give the opportunity. So we would still provide notice to the county, and then we're going to have to provide notice to our residents about the scheduled date for a hearing, right? And then you, the public would have the opportunity to object through that public hearing process. I think that with our street program the way it is, we really do need to go ahead and and give notice at this point in time, because, you know, as we see the wayfinding uh, survey and the re return of that, I think that there's gonna be a real sense of demand for us to do yeah. and move forward with this. Well, and I, again, we'll talk about it more in a couple of weeks, but we've also talked about in our last work session about the impact of dark store um, and, and a desire potentially to set aside some reserves you know, for that. So I think there are lots of opportunities um, for us to still be very um, conservative and judicious and, and not wasting that $135,000 that we might anticipate. And that's assuming nobody protests and anything between now and then, so. that would come forward to mission sure it's in regards to south dakota versus wayfair or wayfair versus south dakota i'm not sure which way it went but uh you know we're out of state retailers that didn't have a brick and mortar here uh we're not paying sales taxes and uh with that case those sales those uh out-of-state uh, merchandisers were, are going to have to collect sales tax for the state of Kansas. I don't have specific numbers, but we can certainly look at that and incorporate that and what the impact of that would be. And I think there's a chance that the Kansas legislature didn't do what they needed to do to get that going this year, but I can't remember how that played out at the end of session. So that might also be I think, a necessary I think you're check. right there, but we'll go back and take a look at. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> at that if case. they didn't do anything, they'll put a lot of effort into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it is, but okay. Um, then next slide, last slide is really just again, a recap of, so July 7th, finance and admin, and we really have very little else, a um, couple of minutes and one other maintenance item, I think, on the, the agendas. So really our whole focus on the 7th will be the budget. So we'll be bringing forward a recommended budget, the 2022 to 2026 CIP, which will focus on streets, stormwater, parks and recreation, um, supplemental requests. So we'll, what we will show you is all of the supplemental requests that the departments um, have, have come up with uh, and or that you all have identified as budget priorities. We'll show you from a staff perspective, we'll rank those in terms of our priorities so that you have a sense of what we would recommend including in the budget. And then obviously you'll have the opportunity to impact um, those supplemental requests as well. Um, right now we are scheduled to do the um, community dialogue, which is always so well attended. Um, on the recommended budget at our July 21st city council meeting. We did advertise that in the issue of the mission magazine that should be hitting mailboxes. If anybody pays attention, we'll put that out on social. Um, if, if we do decide following the meeting on the 7th that we are specifically planning to um, exceed that revenue neutral rate, then we can um, push out the public hearing on the budget, and we would then have to conduct a public hearing on the budget sometime between August 20th and September 20th. So if we if we make that decision on July 7th, um, we'll probably adjust those August uh, dates and timeframes to align with that. And that's all I have this evening, which is more than enough. Um, this is related to when you were talking earlier about 
acquisition of more green space and just in light of kind of our conversation tonight about how we don't actually own waterworks or streamway and those are kind of the two parks in the northern part of town that are around there um is it realistic to think that the forest could be something that we make a play at down the road i mean is it still a pipe dream at this phase could you just kind of talk about how realistic that might be in a future you know acquisition of a city like a it, it it, it would be nice to know that we actually own one of those parks up there, especially as we're having these discussions to make investments and, you know, that sort of thing. And I'd, I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind as a, as a thing I'd like to see the city try to pursue, if it makes sense. So could you just kind of speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think from the staff perspective, what we would, what we would do is take... Um, you know, we asked the question, we asked the question in the budget survey, if you had, you know, sole responsibility for spending that excess general fund fund balance, what would you spend it on? And we can revisit, you know, we can revisit that. It, from, from, I think, our perspective, um, you know, one of the things that we're now incorporating based on kind of the final decision on the ARPA funds is what that looks like and how that impacts um, our general fund fund balance. Uh, I think our plan would be to present to you kind of the supplemental requests um, and then say, you know, here are the ones that are definitely going in. And then if we see revenue recovery in a certain area that we might advance these priorities. I mean, I think that's that would be the reasonable approach in this year where we're, there's still some uncertainty in terms of uh, some of, you know, some of those funding so that we, we can set those milestones and say, okay, if we're on track with revenues by X amount of time, then, then this would be our next priority to sort of tick off in the 2021. And I think we'll make those recommendations both for 2021 and into 2022. Nope, you're off next Wednesday. Don't, no, I'm going on vacation, so we're off next Wednesday. <laughs> no, the Broadmoor meeting's on Tuesday, so yes. I'm going absolutely nowhere, but I am not going to be here at a meeting. How about that? Yeah, no, it's this, this weekend, my, uh, I can't believe it, but our granddaughter who was born sort of three weeks early last year at this time is getting ready to celebrate her first birthday. So yeah, so that's good. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. All right, well, seeing, uh, does anyone have any other questions, comments? If not, I think we are probably good to adjourn. So, thank you. Everyone enjoy the weekend. And okay.